Hi everyone, this is Dr. Alex Hall. Today we're gonna to be making a clay model of the female internal reproductive system. So to start with, to give us some context, we're gonna begin with the most posterior of the structures that we're gonna find in the female pelvis, and that's actually going to be the rectum. So I'm just gonna go ahead and create a rectum here. Right, which is of course receiving stool from the sigmoid colon. All right, so then just anterior to the rectum, we are going to find the vagina. And so the vagina is a muscular tube. I'm gonna do it kind of on cross section. Right, so you can kind of see it as if the top half has been lifted off. All right, and the interesting thing about, there's lots of interesting things about the vagina, but one of the interesting things about it is that the inside has all these accordion-like folds called rugae that then allow it to expand, right? For intercourse, for babies, right? It needs to be expansile. So you might remember that the stomach also had rugae or folds. So the vagina is this muscular tube then that is going to lead up into the uterus. So in a person who's never had a full-term pregnancy before, the uterus is about the same size as their fist. So this is a fairly accurate size-wise, perhaps not shape, <laughs> representation of a uterus, which is going to sit at the top of the vagina there. And so let's find, hmm, trying to see what can give us space, I don't know. So where the uterus has its opening, right, at the top of the vagina, there is a round structure that forms a little canal and that is going to be the cervix, also called the neck of the uterus. So let's go ahead and place that here, like that. Let's use, let's see if we can prop that up a little bit. Okay, so now we've got our vagina, our rectum, our uterus, the cervix. You can see how the vagina comes up around that cuff of the cervix and kind of forms these little corners. Those are called the vaginal fornices. They're like these little peekaboo niches, little hiding spots here. That's a vaginal fornix, this is a vaginal fornix. So as we move up into the uterus, the uterus is actually comprised of three layers. Let's have this orange one represent the middle layer of the uterus, which is called the myometrium. Myo because myo means muscle, and that middle layer is composed of muscle, which allows it to contract, right, involuntarily. It's smooth muscle, allows it to contract to expel menstrual blood and to expel a baby, right? There is an inner layer of the uterus, inner lining here, and that is called the endometrium. That's the part of the uterus that's gonna thicken up each month during a typical menstrual cycle, and then if no pregnancy occurs, it's gonna break down and be shed off. The outer layer, so we have three layers to the uterus. The middle layer is the myometrium, the muscle. The inner layer is the endometrium. That's the glandular layer that builds up and sloughs off. And then our outermost layer is called the perimetrium. So I'm just going to kind of stick that on like that. Peri, P-E-R-I, means around the outside of, like the word perimeter. So here's our uterus. We have our three layers, perimetrium, myometrium, and endometrium. And this is going to be attached to our fallopian tubes. I'm gonna to need to use purple. So we have two fallopian tubes, one on each side. They're also sometimes called uterine tubes. So if you see that word, don't be alarmed. It is the same thing. So fallopian tubes and uterine tubes are the same thing. So I'm creating my tubes right now. 
break that in half. And so each of those is going to come into the uterus like this. And the fallopian tubes themselves have several different regions. So right where it's coming into the uterus, it's relatively narrow. And so that's called the isthmus, I-S-T-H-M-U-S, referring to that geologic feature where you have a narrow strip of land in between two bodies of water, because this is kind of like a narrow strip of tissue coming in. So that's the isthmus. Then this next part here is called the ampulla. And then as we move out towards the ends of the fallopian tubes, it starts to widen and that is called the infundibulum. So I always remember it as I-A-I, -I, isthmus, ampulla, infundibulum. When we get to the very ends of the fallopian tubes, there are these little finger-like projections that kind of go <laughs> to help create a current to pull any ovary that's released into the fallopian tubes. Those little finger-like fronds at the end are called fimbriae. Those are the fimbriae. And so these fallopian tubes or uterine tubes are going to be in close relationship to the ovaries, one on each side. And the ovaries are kind of oval shaped. They're like an unshelled almond in size. So this is a little bit larger than life size. So the ovaries are held in place by two different ligaments. The first ligament that we're gonna talk about has a pretty basic name. It's the ovarian ligament. So the ovarian ligament is gonna attach the ovary to the uterus, right? That's Attach the ovarian ligament, attaches the ovary to the uterus. The ovaries have a second ligament called the suspensory ligament of the ovary. And the suspensory ligament is attached out to the abdominal wall on each side and then travels down posterior to the fallopian tube to attach to the ovary. And the suspensory ligaments are super duper important because they carry the ovarian artery and vein. So these are the same structures that we called the gonadal artery and vein when we were doing the posterior abdominal viscera, right? And because we actually are gendered here, this is an ovary. These are the ovarian artery and vein traveling in the suspensory ligament of the ovary. The uterus itself also has two pairs of ligaments. So we have ovaries have ovarian ligaments and suspensory ligaments of the ovary. The uterus also has two sets of ligaments. The first one is a set of what we would kind of think of as ligaments that come out and attach to the anterior abdominal wall. These are called the round ligaments. So the round ligaments come out and attach the uterus to the anterior abdominal wall. I might have made those too large to be able to stand up on their own. There we go. There's another ligament, but it's not really a ligament. It's called the broad ligament, and I'm gonna use some saran wrap to represent it here, because what it is, is it's actually the parietal peritoneum, so that membrane that covers the inside of the whole abdominal pelvic cavity, as it comes down, it covers the uterus and the posterior aspect of the uterus. Oh, I'm stuck to the rectum back here. Kind of like so. And it sticks, I'm gonna get my round ligament out of there. It sticks to itself. I'm moving the round ligament away because it's causing problems right now. So it sticks to itself. So this part is called the broad ligament of the uterus. It's really just the parietal peritoneum, but it sticks to itself on either side here. And so we call it the broad ligament of the uterus. When that parietal peritoneum, which forms the broad ligament, comes here, we have to think about what structure is anterior to the uterus. 
And the answer is the urinary bladder. So the urinary bladder is sitting anterior to our uterus, just behind the pubic symphysis. And this parietal peritoneum comes down the anterior surface of the uterus and then up the posterior surface of the bladder. And so this little pouch that is formed here, this little pocket, is called the vesico-uterine pouch. Because vesicle just means a fluid-filled thing, so our urinary bladder can be considered a fluid thing, fluid-filled thing. So we have the vesico-uterine pouch right here. And then, posteriorly, between the uterus and the rectum, we also have a little pocket of peritoneum, and that is called the recto-uterine pouch. So we have the recto-uterine pouch, and we have the vesico-uterine pouch. I'm gonna create a urethra now, coming down from the urinary bladder, which is not my best creation, I have to say. That's all right. So the urethra is going to come down to reach the vulva. I'm just gonna let it rest on the vagina for now. Well, let's close that up. It's just a little bit more realistic. If you'll let me. All right. And the final thing that we're gonna talk about are Skene's glands. So Skene's glands are two little tiny groupings of glands that sometimes can secrete some fluid during orgasm. So we have two little glands and their openings, and they are located in between the vagina and the urethra. And their openings come out either side of the opening of the urethra. So sometimes if someone has fluid that is secreted from Skene's glands with orgasm, what you might have heard referred to as female ejaculation, which only occurs, we think, in about 10 to 20% of female-bodied people, but sometimes because the fluid comes out from right here, it can feel a little bit to them like they've peed. So there's our female internal reproductive structures. We have the rectum, the vagina, Skene's glands, urethra, urinary bladder, ovaries, suspensory ligament of the ovary with the ar artery and vein, ovarian artery and vein, ovarian ligament attaches the ovary to the uterus. The uterus itself, we have the inner endometrium, middle myometrium, outer perimetrium, round ligament, broad ligament right here and right here. And then we have the vesicouterine pouch and the recto-uterine pouch. Also, let's not forget those little corners where the vagina comes up around the opening to the cervix, the vaginal fornices, right there. So there's your internal female reproductive system.